Good morning um, and welcome everyone. Thank you for being here, the first uh, visitors of the F Vienna Humanities Festival's third day program. As you probably uh, noticed already, Yasha Munk is not with us. Um, he had a serious health uh, issue in the family which kept him back home. But um, I'm sure that we'll have an interesting uh, conversation about a similar topic, and namely um, populism versus democracy in Central and Eastern Europe. I already have a question whether this versus is well placed there, or whether it shouldn't be as part of democracy, but probably this will be part of the discussion. Um, we have uh, today with us Piotr Burash, who comes from Poland. He is a political analyst working with uh, the European Council for Foreign Relations there. Uh, and he will be introduced by Tim Judah, who is a um, journalist working with The Economist in London. Both are fellows this month at um, uh, EVM, Institute für die Wissenschaften von Menschen, with its Europe's Futures program. So, enjoy the conversation. I hand well, to you, Tim. Th th thank you very much. Well, um, uh, as, as you can see, that there's been some bad news. Unfortunately, Yashamon couldn't be here, but uh, the good news is that we're going to make a, a, a better panel. Um, and that's why um, Piotr was chosen to, to talk about this, uh, th this topic. Um, a, a former journalist with um, Gazeta Viborcha and Berlin correspondent, I believe, and, uh, and now um, head of ECR, the European Council on Foreign Relations um, office in uh, Warsaw. Well, if you believe, like us, that uh, so, uh, somehow united Europe um, is, is a good thing, then um, the, 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 the news of the last uh, few years uh, from Britain, from France, from Italy, and of course from Hungary and Poland and other parts of Central Europe has been um, quite uh, depressing. Um, we're going to focus on Central Europe, but perhaps we shouldn't only talk about Central Europe. Um, some of the ideas of Monk talk about illiberal democracy and undemocratic uh, liberalism. Um, Piotr is going to talk for about 20 minutes and then we're going to discuss a bit and then, then we're going to sort of uh, uh, open it up. But uh, perhaps I should just start off by asking you the title of this talk, um, uh, as we've heard, is Populism and, and Versus Democracy. But um, maybe that's wrong. It's not actually versus democracy, is it? It's really populism versus liberalism, perhaps. But anyway, um, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tim. And uh, thank you very much for all of you who came to attend this, uh, um, this meeting, despite the fact that I'm uh, clearly not Yasha Munk. Uh, <laughs> and it's uh, certainly very disappointing for, for many of you. Um, but I will try to, indeed, to, uh, to say a few words about the topic um, which we described as populist versus democ democracy, which is, which is, of course, a provocation. Because, uh, as, he, as Tim uh, rightly pointed out, uh, it's, it's not... Um, the, the real problem is... Um, Populism versus liberalism. That should be the, the real title of the of the uh, um, uh, of our conversation. But there are, of course, some uh, important reasons why uh, one should believe that um, populism is also a, a threat uh, to democracy. But let's start with some very brief explanation, which would maybe uh, draw uh, to some extent upon. Uh, Yasha Munk's uh, very good uh, book. Uh, Munk writes in his books that there is an inherent tension in the liberal democracy as a concept between liberalism and democracy. And the, the democratic principle is, is clearly, we know it from history, is much older than, than liberalism and uh, doesn't have actually much to do with that. Uh, it means in the essence that as many important decisions as possible in a given public sphere are taken by popular majorities of equal citizens. And this majorita majoritarian aspect, this majoritarianism, can be limited only if the majoritarian rule could possibly stop some citizens from participating in the democratic decision process. And the liberal principle is clearly different. It places emphasis on the fundamental value of 
individual or individual rights. And it places emphasis on the assumption that the legitimate scope of public power is limited. And those limits are laid out in a constitution which introduces a system of separation of power, checks and balances. And the system makes sure that the individual and minority rights um, uh, can be protected. And what we experience today is in fact not an attack against the democratic principle as I described it, but uh, much more against the liberal uh, principle. And when I'm saying that, I'm talking about the origins of the current crisis of the liberal democracy and, and about the motivations of its opponents. And if and how the assault against liberalism may translate into a demolition of democracy itself is a different question. But I believe that this distinction is very important. And not at least against the background of our historical experience, uh, and some analogies which are drawn today with the pre-war time and uh, the rise of uh, authoritarianism in Europe back then. In the 30s or 20s, the dissatisfaction and despair of wide ranges of social groups in many European countries, including Poland, was channeled by political forces towards um, a fundamental rejection of uh, parliamentarianism, party state, uh, and democracy in the end. In, in this country, I think uh, as a particular document, a certain document, uh, Kronneuburger Eid, is probably very well known, a, a document issued in um, 1930 uh, by Heimwehr, this uh, right-wing radical military organization which paved the way for the, for the um, conservative dictatorship. And this document, for example, says in German, wir verwerfen den westlichen demokratischen Parlamentarismus und den Parteienstaat. We denounce the Western democratic party system and, um, or, or party state and parliamentarianism. And uh, the same was true actually for, for Poland, under Piłsudski, and for many other countries. But I think the difference to the 30s is does not just the fact that the erosion of the liberal democratic foundations is taking place today without military violence, but also that this democratic principle as such is not really put in question, just the opposite. The populists claim that they uh, represent the real democracy and they want to have more democracy and more of, of the majoritarian principle, more of the, of the rule of, of the majority. And moreover, the change is sought not by means of installing a strong leader in a revolutionary manner, uh, but rather by introducing a change step by step, uh, sort of salami tactics, um, and uh, what is very important under a formal adherence to uh, the electoral rules, and which is even more important, by seeking a formal and broad democratic legitimacy. And I would argue that what may emerge from this process is not something we know very well from the past, but rather a new sort of hybrid political system, one which perhaps resembles more the Russian or, or current Russian or tur Turkish regimes, even if, at least for the time being, they does, does not, I mean, Poland and Hungary do not come close to, uh, to that examples. Mm, but it, it would be a system which enjoys indeed support of a sufficient part of the society to claim a high level of the legitimacy, but at the same time is narrowing the space for the opposing voices, which entrenches itself in the state and economic structures of the country, and in effect renders a democratic change less and less likely to happen or even impossible. And you can call it illiberal democracy or neo-authoritarianism. What counts is that its rise is a phenomenon which almost nobody in Europe uh, expected to emerge. So the question is, how did we get there? And, and the more disturbing question for us in Central Eastern Europe is how unique is actually our adventure with populism. 
We can, of course, consolidate ourselves by saying that um, each and every country in Europe has its own uh, Kaczynski or, or Orban, but we shouldn't fool ourselves. It, it is, at the moment, only Poland and Hungary which do away with the separation of powers. It is, apart from Italy, only the Visegrad countries where the populists are really in power um, or have at least a running, really running the, the government. And, uh, and that in a situation where Slovakia and Poland have been the fastest growing economies in Europe um, over the last decade. And um, all of these countries were basically s seen as examples of very successful economic and democratic transformation. So what has happened then? I don't want to convince you that populism is in, in Central Eastern Europe a, a, you know, a regional specialty like goulash or, or uh, pierogi. And I, I believe that despite all those problems which we are facing, the EU enlargement was a good thing and uh, had it not taken place, we, Europe would be a much more unpleasant place to live now. Uh, but I'm convinced that the Central and Eastern European crisis has something very genuine. And that the backlash against uh, liberalism in Central Eastern Europe um, is particularly strong and successful. So the question is why? So let me offer maybe four ideas uh, which could hopefully help us better understand this specific problem with populism in Central Eastern Europe. And first is, of course, economics does matter. And uh, despite the general success of the transformation in uh, um, uh, Central Eastern Europe, uh, which can be measured by growth rates and falling like unemployment, the, the questions of distribution and pain uh, of change uh, certainly do matter. And even if the economic cycle and, and uh, the level of wealth in Central Eastern Europe have been different than in Western Europe, the grievances among the people related to this relative deprivation uh, have been roughly the same. So in this sense, I think when it comes to economy, the new Europe is it's not really so much different from, uh, from, um, from Western Europe. What is, I think, more relevant uh, is what I would call a conflation of liberalism and neoliberalism as a collective experience in, uh, in Central Eastern Europe. Or put it in a, in a, in a simpler way, the, the experiment of establishing the foundation of a liberal democratic state in parallel with the radical market economic transformation. And, and I think that this makes Central Eastern Europe special. And why? Because the Eastern Europe has uh, experienced a, a, diff a completely different path from, from uh, Western Europe um, in the aftermath of the Second World War. That was, in Western Europe, you had this Trente uh, Glorieuse, the 30 years of uh, economic development, uh, leveling down of social uh, inequalities, uh, uh, the promise of fairness, and that was the time where the, the liberal democracies in Western Europe got stabilized. That was what Tony Jatt uh, described as the social democratic era in, in the European history. And neoliberalism was in the West actually only a later correction, uh, even if we can it as, as a completely misguided correction. That was a correction to, to some problems which mm, resulted from the overblown state services, indebtedness, and so on and so forth. The Central Eastern Europe developed on a completely different path. When its uh, democratic systems were established after the fall of, of communists, they experienced a, a neoliberal era, not a social democratic era. And the, the, the result was a, a progressing individualization in, in the society at the ex expense of, the, of social capital. It was um, a deepening of the lack of, of mutual trust. It was um, clearly a process which did not create this kind of social cohesion like in the West, rather the opposite. And this transition process initiated fragmentation of the society, which used to be actually more equal in a, of course, sort of um, peculiar sense, but, but still 
the, the differences within the society were rising in inequalities. And, but what is perhaps more important is, is the very idea of the state, that is a concept of a strong state was basically rejected by the elites. And in a way, the transformation in Central Eastern Europe brought about very strong economies, quite atomized societies, and states not delivering enough public goods. And for these reasons, I would argue this regional version of adventure with neoliberalism undermined the foundation of liberalism as such. And second, the second um, idea why Central Eastern Europe is sort of different is linked to that. And uh, I think it's, a, it's an often underestimated phenomenon, which is the, uh, basically the absence of the left. Uh, and it sh of course, it shouldn't come as a surprise because you know the left, this ideology uh, was um, compromised by the era of communism. And uh, but it's of course not that uh, the left parties uh, were not in power. The, the ex-communist party in Poland came back to power um, as early as 1993. But it's what uh, what what is uh, more important is that the left agenda was almost non-existent. The political and economic liberalism was the only game in town, clearly. And the left was discredited. Uh, basically, the whole political class subscribed to the Washington Consensus. But it is not, you know, what I'm saying is it shouldn't be understood as just a, cri a criticism um, of uh, neo neoliberal uh, thought. But mm, the, the real problem is that uh, this created a, a rather dysfunctional party systems because the, the politics of Central Eastern Europe has never been characterized by this left-right dichotomy, which had, a, I would argue, a, a stabilizing effect uh, in Western societies, uh, considering the fact that both left and right uh, were part of the pro-liberal democratic consensus. And in Central Eastern Europe, the result was a very vulnerable political system. And Anton Shekhovtsov wrote a, a, a very um, renowned expert on, on populism and, 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 and right-wing parties. He wrote once, uh, very rightly, that when liberal parties fail, democratic alternatives are not always available in Central Eastern Europe. And, and this is exactly what happened in Poland with Kaczynski. That was exactly what happened with, with Hungary, uh, in Hungary with Orban. They were the, the only alternatives to the liberal elites who had lost the confidence of the voters. Then the third point I wanted to make, and perhaps is, is perhaps the most important one, and um, it is a paradox, because the, the rise of populism in Central and Eastern Europe is often seen as a reflection of an inferiority complex, disappointment with Europe or identity crisis. But actually, when you look closer, the opposite is true. Arguably, Kaczynski's and Orban's uh, success would have been much less likely to happen without the safety net offered by the European Union and uh, the successful transformation and membership um, in NATO and, 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 and in the EU. But even more importantly, I think the psychological state of mind which underlies the current political transformation and which gives boost to the populist is not only or not in the first place that of, of a feeling of, of weakness. It, it's rather actually a feeling of strength in, in those countries. And where it comes from and how relevant it is, it, it, is, it can be best explained against the, the background of what Ivan Krastev and Stephen Holmes recently called the policy of imitation to describe the, the post-1989 transformation. And this transformation was in Central Eastern Europe strongly informed by a certain myth of the West and the ideology of, of catching up with Western Europe or the ideology or the idea of becoming like the West. And it is not just that the 
multiple EU crises and even more fundamental crises of the West have undermined the foundation of the myth of the West um, or the myth of the EU as a safe harbor, a source of identity and a promise of a better future. As Krastev at Holmes rightly noticed, while in 1989 liberalism was associated with appealing ideals of individual freedom, legal fairness, and governmental transparency, in 2010 it had been tainted by two decades of association with really existing and inevitably faulty post-communist governments. But I think there is even more to that. And despite this, this populist uh, rhetoric about, for example, Poland as a ruined country after 30 years of transformation, and that was the language of Kaczynski, and despite the unsatisfied aspirations in large parts of the society, which helped a lot the rise of Kaczynski or Orban, there is also, paradoxically, a new sort of self-confidence and pride they can build upon to break with this imitation narrative and even claim moral or political superiority with regard to Western Europe. And this is what I referred as this new feeling of strength. That, that's a paradox that 30 years ago, the West was seen as, the West was strong and the East was weak. And today, the rules have in a way inverted. The West, Western Europe is morally rotten, economically inefficient, protectionist, it has learned, it hasn't learned from, from the mistakes of multiculturalism, while the blooming economy and national homogeneity uh, in Central Eastern Europe are seen as sources of, of stability. And this rhetoric, very much exploited by, by Orban or, mm, or Kaczynski, may come across and, uh, as very anti-Western or anti-European and, and indeed uh, remind of, of Putin's tirades. But it's, it is actually framed differently. The, the PIS, the Kaczynski party, um, and, those, and, and its supporters, they believe that Poland represents today the real West, whereas Western Europe has betrayed Western values. And since this transformation of European societies has been consciously driven by the left liberal elites of the 1968 generation, that is the, the narrative, Kaczynski believes that it can be consciously also rolled back. And Poland may play an important role driving the EU to its genuine cultural roots. And fourth and, and last and often cited explanation is that Central and Eastern Europe is particularly xenophobic or nationalist. I, I'm not sure if it is uh, completely right. Um, I think certainly not in this gener generality. But I think what is indisputable is that the strength of conservative and national traditions um, which can be easy mobilized in times of crisis um, by political reason, uh, leaders is, uh, is quite significant. And, uh, and this is, in a way, not surprising that anti-liberalism draws upon conservative or right-wing traditions because the people in times of crisis seek um, sort of stability by... by um, drawing upon uh, the ideas of religion, uh, nation, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but um, I think in, in Central Eastern Europe, it is even more uh, um, apparent uh, because of the lack of any strong leftist traditions. So the, when you, you want to reject liberalism, you can basically draw only on, um, on conservative or nationalistic, basically, tradition, if you, if you, if you look at the past. And, and also, what, what comes on the top of that is that the pre-war nationalism uh, has never been really discredited in, uh, um, in Central Eastern Europe. And the fact that history, that in the history of the region, the evil always, uh, or mostly, came from abroad not from within, like, let's say, in Germany, in Austria, in Italy, in some other countries. It is, of course, uh, another element which supports this kind of um, 
attitude and, and also makes defensive and mistrustful sentiments even more plausible. I would like to finish with just two, three very brief questions, which I, I, I honestly don't have uh, any definite answers to, uh, but I think which are key if we want to ask ourselves what the future could bring. And the first question is um, exactly the title. I mean, the question is, as much as liberalism and democracy are on the ground of theory, two different animals, can their progressing separation from one another not damage democracy? So can illiberal democracies exist or not slide into authoritarianism? I'm, I'm very skeptical. Uh, in Hungary since uh, 2010, the process of democratic backsliding has never stopped. And John Locke famously wrote that where the law ends, tyranny starts. And the assault on the rule of law is ongoing, bo both in, in Hungary and Poland. And the second question is if the West European political system are resilient enough to defend itself against the threat of this new authoritarianism. Because so far the populists in many European countries have successfully invaded the political sphere, they changed the public discourse, they affected political culture, the politics is becoming more messy, but the fundamental structures of liberal democratic system are still in place. And this is the key difference to, to, to Poland and Hungary. But the question is, will it hold? And the third, I think, most fundamental question is about the EU. The EU is based upon a, a principle of constitutional pluralism. So it means that each state is basically allowed to define its own political system or political structures. But the question is how far this constitutional pluralism can go and how define the red lines. And can we live in a, in a EU with illiberal, semi-authoritarian, liberal, democratic, maybe, I don't know, different kinds of regimes? And if we cannot, so what instruments the EU has at its disposal to prevent the disintegration resulting from the collapse of liberalism, um, which is now happening? I hope we can dive into these few questions into in our well thank you thank you, you very thank much, you very much. Um, just before we um just before we began this um Piotr, i asked you whether you were writing a book and you looked surprised and said no but this looks like a a, a book uh, <laughs> struggling to get out here so uh, i'm hoping to read it in book form and maybe next year then we'll dispense with yasha monk and come back with your book sorry can you hear me all right is there, can everyone hear me all right good um well this is obviously kind of alarming and uh, uh, and scary, but perhaps I can just start off by asking you about Poland, since obviously you're from Poland and know it, know it better. I mean, this question of irreversibility, I mean, how, how, how far are we from this kind of proper state capture, or has it already happened in Poland, and, uh, and, and is it already becoming irreversible, especially if there's no credible opposition? Yeah, I think, you know, it's it's happening under our, our eyes and it has happened to a large extent already. I mean, the last news from, because, you know, the, the big thing in Poland is indeed the, the capture of the um, of the judicial system by the by the party, the full control of the of the judiciary. So the this is the background of these um, discussions we have with uh, with the European Commission. Uh, there is an infringement procedure against uh, the Polish legislation on, on the Supreme Court and, and, and others. Uh, and this is indeed a, a, a fundamental issue about um, the separation of powers and uh, the question how far the executive can control uh, the, um, ex uh, the the judiciary and and uh, if it uh, can control it at all, but it, 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 the, the question is how far it can go and and uh, and and I think what we observe both in 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 Poland and Hungary is uh, how the political leaders are testing the limits, and this is uh, on and over again. The, the, the last news from Poland is that uh, there is um, new, a reform planned now by the Minister of Justice, um, a reform of the um, um, of the legislation on the journalistic 
and um, barristers' uh, secret, you say, or uh, you know that there are some uh, sources. Are you talking about yeah, sources? sources yes, um, I mean the revealing sources about the right. when, how, and when the barristers or or journalists are obliged to reveal their sources. So this is normally in the normal situation. It is a court, independent court, which basically determines. Uh, that a journalist or a barrister has to reveal his or her source. According to the uh, new legislation which is planned and, and it has become public, it would be the uh, uh, prosecutor who would uh, decide if a barrister or uh, a journalist has to reveal sources. The, the, prosec the, the prosecutor general in Poland, so it means the boss of all prosecutors in the country, is the minister of justice in Poland. Um, so it means basically that there is a case, there would be a case against the minister of justice, uh, which is actually taking place. I mean, th there are cases where, where mm, the minister of justice is sued for overstepping basically his mandate. The Minister of Justice could ask the prosecutor to <laughs> um, let the barrister uh, defending or representing the, the people claiming against the minister to reveal the source of, of whatever information. So th that this is, I, I'm not sure if this law is going to, to, to pass, but this is, it is happening. I mean, this is happening. It's, uh, and, so I, that's why I, my skepticism about, mm, you know, is it possible basically to, 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 to change the course? And what's the answer? I'm skeptical. You're skeptical. I, you I, don't, I mean, you think you're yeah, yeah. Okay, I mean, in, 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 in Hungary, uh, uh, the, the situation is, I think, um, uh, in, in, a, in a sense, much worse because uh, the, the urban system has uh, been entrenched in the part in the, in the structures of the of the country of the, of the state. Um, is entrenched in the economic structures. It's based upon a certain um, oligarchy, and and I think the. The Polish uh, regime is still not there, uh, and but we we are facing uh, parliamentary elections next year, and that will be the, the most important election in over the last thirty years. Because if this election is lost by the liberals, I think we will be making very big steps on the in the direction of, uh, of sort of semi authoritarian regime. And if that, well, you've, you've made a case that the, the, the roots of it in Central and Eastern Europe are, are different, but it, it's not, it, you know, Central and Eastern Europe is not by itself. I mean, we've seen what's happening in Italy, for example, and then we've got the European elections in May. Um, so we're going to have probably commissioners, you know, real kind of uh, believers or party of these parties and of these increasingly authoritarian regimes uh, in in Europe. So, what sort of what does that mean for the European Union itself? Are we going to be transforming the European Union, or will they be transforming it from from the inside, or will we will we be setting up a clash between these kind of authoritarian forces and uh, those who oppose them, like Macron in, in France? And if so, what does that mean for the future? I think this is indeed what is at the moment at stake um, in, in Europe and the, the next year parliamentary election will be, EP election, the election to the European Parliament will be uh, indeed um, a, a big confrontation between um, those political forces in the nation states, in the member states, which um, have a completely different idea of um, not only of society but to some extent also of the, of the um, uh, political system and those who um, try to, to defend uh, a certain set of values which are you know, fundamental for the fun up to my um, um, understanding of the European Union. And I, I think there is a sort of a, um, we, we, we can observe a, a, 
pan-European international in a way being created by a variable system of, of alliances between uh, Salvini, Orban, Strache, uh, um, uh, AfD in, in Germany and um, Kaczynski in Poland. And it's, I'm not saying that they are already forming a coherent uh, political group, but all of them uh, are challenging uh, indeed the fundamentals of the European Union. And I think this is, this is what, um, what uh, um, requires a, a, a reaction from uh, not only for, for, from liberal political forces, but also for civil society, from, from, from um, uh, you know, uh, I would say European, European parties. The, for me, the, the main battle today, the main political battle is played, uh, um, is been playing out not in uh, between the liberals and, and the populists, but actually within the European center right. Because this is uh, what's happening in the, um, in the European People's Party, the question of should Viktor Orban uh, remain member of the same political grouping um, uh, with Angela Merkel and uh, Sebastian Kurz and, and other uh, you know, traditional conservative Christian democratic parties. I think this is, in a way, a, a, a really a political, not legalistic, a political battle for ideas. I mean, and I think the threat is that the, the political mainstream, which is still you know, very much center-right, I think, in Europe, <laughs> this is at least in, in terms of, of the political parties, the center-right is still the strongest political camp. My fear is that, that not that the populist will gain power in the next European election and would completely reshape the, um, the, the, the European structures, but rather that they will change the way how the European center-right thinks and acts. And I think this is even more uh, dangerous because it's much less visible. It's basically the classic sort of the, the right is shifting further the right, right yeah. and perhaps drawing the rest of the center yeah. uh, further further right with it yeah. uh -huh. but you of course you're you're quite right about these sort of links and um, just as a sort of anecdote this morning I was um, following a link by uh, Macedonian journalist tomorrow of course is the referendum in Macedonia on the change of name which um, certainly some um, uh, some some in 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 that camp, uh, you know, are championing uh, and well, not a no vote. They want a boycott um, um, because it's to do with, or well, they say, to do with the question of identity. But the interesting thing about the the link, which was written by, um, um, it was a, it was an article by a Macedonian journalist who's uh, against the change of name and in campaigning for a boycott, was that it was published in English. It was published on a. Website, a new Slovene website in English, which was then full of articles about um, uh, Hungary and uh, Poland and Christianity and uh, and identity, uh, also mixed in with um, articles about um, the discovery of Atlantis and other kind of strange and uh, uh, and, and weird things. Um, but, but <laughs> But still, um, so, but it, before we kind of just open and d discuss with everybody else here, I mean, is there any kind of um, chink of light? Or is there any light at the end of the tunnel? Is there anything to be um, optimistic about if one believes, like us, in a kind of liberal uh, and uh, united Europe? I don't know. I, I just, I, I don't want to be, uh, you know, too, too pessimistic, but... Uh I think we are really in a very long haul. It's not that we can expect uh, some very fast changes and uh, reversal of this trend, um, at, at least in Central Eastern, at least in my country or in Hungary, uh, in a very short term. I mean, of course, uh, one thing is important. Uh, it is not that in Poland, um, Unlike in Hungary, but I think even in Hungary, there is not an you know, overwhelming majority supporting Orban. Uh, this is apparently this is even not even a majority. It's even less than fifty percent of people who effectively would like to vote for uh, for, for for Orban. In, in Poland, is 
the the picture, the right picture, is also of a, of a very polarized, extremely divided country. And uh, in this sense, it would be uh, foolish to uh, to say that you know everything is lost and uh, uh, there is no light in the tunnel, and that, but. You know, that's that's the big picture. I, I think the, the the society is much more liberal, or the part of the society is much more liberal than the electoral results would suggest, and and the 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 general picture you have from from the media, from uh, you know news, and and uh, from what I have just said. But the, the the but my skepticism is based upon uh, just a very sober analysis of of political trends and uh, electoral uh, surveys and uh, what and, and I I'm worried that uh, this trend, despite the fact that we have a polarized society, that we have a divided country, uh, and that part of society is by far not happy with the with what's going on, that that this uh, this can. Uh, continue. Great. Okay. Thank you. Well, let's um, open it up now. Um, I, I'm not quite sure if there are m microphones. Is there, is there someone with a microphone or? Oh, you've got a microphone. Fine. Okay. Um, great. Well, um, please, um, please, uh, w w when you ask a question, please uh, just stand up and just introduce yourself, and um, perhaps we'll take a group of three. But um, o over there. Thanks. Um, my name is Rosa Balfour. I'm a non-resident fellow at the um, IWM with Piotr and Tim. Um, first thing, Piotr, I'd like to agree with Tim. This is at least a long essay, huh, what you just presented us, so I think you could turn it into a book. But I'd like to challenge you a little bit on your definition of democracy. And I might be wrong, but I've heard this a couple of times over the past few days. My impression is that your definition of democracy is pretty thin. It's the skeleton, the classic. So separation of powers, elections, and regulation of negative freedoms. And then the liberal democracy is, is a kind of the, the sort of um, pluralist, addition. Now, in my understanding, and there's a whole, there is loads of literature about this, um, in the European context, liberal democracy, the liberal piece actually refers to how you regulate your economy, and it doesn't refer to the nature of democracy. And if you look at European history, um, democracy in itself is has a lot more quality to it and has a lot more depth. It's also about positive freedoms. Um, it's about pluralism. And in the European and EU context, it's also about a whole set of political, economic, and social, and even cultural rights. OK, that's a bit more controversial. Uh, that are constitutionalized. So in my view, if you talk about democracy, the question of liberal or a liberal is, is not that it, a illiberal democracy essentially is an oxymoron. Um, so I'd just like to prod you a little bit on that because I think that's important for the conclusions that you then draw about illiberal democracy. I don't think that is, you know, so the justification that the Kaczynskis and Orbans have that this is a democracy, but it's majoritarian and thus liberal, it doesn't mean it's not a democracy, that's wrong. That, that those two things are not, um, they, they can't exist together. So that would be my, my challenge. I think partly the reason for which there is confusion is because a lot of the schools on democracy are American, where liberal democracy, the liberal piece refers more to pluralism, etc. But um, that definition in a European context, to me, is a rather neoliberal de definition of democracy, if you see what I mean. Thank you. Uh, okay, well, th thank you very much. Um, I, I suggest that we have like three questions or, or, or comments. Um, would, any, would anyone like to follow up without? Come on, don't be shy. Good, okay. Please don't forget, tell us who you are and um, go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Ah, okay. It's, it's on. It's not on. Sorry? It was. I think you just have to have it close to you. Close to you. Tango Petrov, and I'm a Bulgarian journalist working for, an, for a news website. Uh, you said, Mr. Buras, that uh, the liberal the voters or liberal citizens are much more than manifested from voting results. Then uh, why do, in many cases, in many countries, in many recent elections, do these liberal voters stay home? If so much is at stake, is it just because they don't see a credible alternative to these parties? Because apparently, 
the alternative to these populist parties is to keep the system that they like and they apparently take for granted. Why do you think it happens? Uh, okay, can I just ask you a question if you're, you're from Bulgaria? How many people are on the vo voting roll in Bulgaria and, and how many people live in the country? Because this also has something to do with it. Oh, it's something like 7 million people. Of but course, this is a matter of debate. On the voting roll is 7 million. Yeah, we can say it's but how many people, a million. But the, is there a big difference between the voting roll and the... the it's not like Macedonia. That's what I'm It's not like it's Macedonia. Not, okay, fine. Okay, because sometimes statistics can get distorted about this question of who's staying at home, and but actually, if they're not in the country, then it's a difference. Okay, uh, third one, the l lady over there, a lady over there. My name is Elizabeth Alhimrani. I'm from Vienna, retired uh, employee of an airline. Um, what I was missing, now I was a bit late, but what I was missing now in the definition of democracy, liberal democracy, is the guarantee of a free judiciary. What is, uh, I mean, Orban has uh, made in his way, and I think in, in, um, in Poland too, and what we see now with, uh, in what is going on in America is, I mean, the most significant example. Okay, thank you very much. Well, well Piotr, you've got, you've got three questions there. One from uh, uh, a challenge from Rosa, the question, uh, do why don't voters go out and vote, and judiciaries. So over to you. Yeah, thank you very much for, for these uh, questions. And I, I think I will answer the, the first and the third question together because it, it refers to the same uh, problem of definition of, of uh, liberal democracy. And I think uh, probably there is no disagreement between us because I, I don't buy uh, the argument that you can have an illiberal democracy. I don't buy it either. My point was only to, to and, and in fact, you know, the, the independence of, of judiciary, uh, as you rightly pointed out, is, is, uh, is for me an uh, indispensable part of, of uh, liberal democratic system. Um, I, actually, I, I talked about it at the very beginning, so um, perhaps where, where you were in there. But uh, I think what, is, what I was uh, trying, the point I was trying, was trying to make is that um, the, this majoritarianism uh, which is actually uh, the, the main uh, feature of this uh, populist uh, concept of democracy, in, at least in, in Poland, in Hungary, and, uh, is not trying to make um, a point against the democracy uh, as such as it used to be the case in those who questioned uh, the political system in the 20s and in the 30s. Uh, but it is it's much more, you know, sophisticated way of undermining the, the indeed democratic foundations of the system, um, and this is something I think this this is a new quality because if you I talk with with the Hungarians, but also not only with Hungarians, also with with uh, politicians in, in Europe who say, okay, but actually, you know, you know, Orban Orban still enjoys democratic legitimacy, and this is somewhat true. Uh, because if you, it, it's not that the the, uh, the elections in uh, in Hungary uh, were not uh, free. I think they w they were not fair, but they they were free. And they yeah, so they were not not fair. But nobody forced anybody to vote for Orban. I mean that that that's the uh, that's the point. Nobody, you know, th there were no sanctions for voting for for different parties, like you know, it, it was the case in the communist time in in um, true. In true, region. but uh, uh, as I was saying, you, I mean, you do have public broadcasters which have turned into ruling party broadcasters. So yes, it does make a kind of big difference. Yeah, I, I think it, it. I mean, it is. I, I'm not, as I say, I, I'm, I'm not. Uh, this is my actually. I, I'm using your argument in my discussions with those who defend Orban, <laughs> but, but I, I just want to make uh, this point because I think it, it, it is really a, a, a sort of a new phenomenon. This new authoritarianism, as, as some people describe it. But but I agree that that uh, in the long run it's not um, uh, you know um, uh, in line with the with the democratic principles, and then with the uh, uh, with the question of voting behavior, uh, 
I think that's, that's I, you know, I'm not, um, you know, I'm political analyst, I'm not a theorist of, of um, or I'm not an academic, uh, but I, uh, th this is a, a very big issue in, uh, also in the, the studies on democracy and in political science. Is it really necessary that, that for, for a, you know, democratic system to work that many people go to vote? Uh, I think it's not uh, the conclusion that if you have 90% turnout, uh, it is a better functioning democracy. Is probably mm, would be also far fetched. But but it's true, and I, I think this is a. I'm not saying that that your um, uh, question is not uh, important. It's an extremely important one because the, the fact is that we uh, now, if if you look at the Polish politics. The main question today is how to make sure that those people who basically don't like uh, the current government, that they uh, realize that something important is at stake, because they obviously haven't yet realized or, or, or do not agree that something very important is at stake. And this is, we, we had, uh, but to, to, to uh, uh, you know, show the, the dimension of, of this problem, Last uh, the last parliamentary election in Poland, uh, 2015, we had a turnout of 50 percent. The uh, Kaczynski party got 39 percent of votes, so they got basically not even 20 percent of eligible of, of votes of eligible, uh, you know, uh, citizens, and they. Uh, and the party claims to represent the uh, the whole Polish society, the the will of the people, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, but there, where is the rest? Where are the people? And I, my, uh, uh, the, the one thing is that it's a very constant feature of the Polish um, politics that the turnout has always been extremely low. I mean, extremely low. Fifty percent is actually very low uh, for in the national elections. Uh, so there's, it hasn't been any change over the last 30 years, and uh, so so this is uh, something which uh, even you know the best experts in uh, you know electoral behavior are a bit confused about what what is actually the reason. But there is also a, a reason I think uh, today on the uh, sort of supply side. That uh, and this is about how the opposition is um, um, is positioning itself, and I'm not I, I'm not going to criticize the, uh, the the civic platform, the main opposition party, which is a liberal liberal conservative, but rather my point is again about the left. Uh, that uh, I'm pretty sure that if we do not have a relatively strong left party in Poland with a good leader, uh, we will not be able to uh, remove the Kaczynski party from power for, for another few years. Because uh, Kaczynski has stolen, uh, to put it uh, in, a, in a drastic way, the social agenda uh, and uh, no liberal uh, party can regain the ground uh, because it, it would be not uh, basically uh, legitimate or it would not be credible as a, as a defender of, of social rights. So the left is absolutely needed as a party which w could form a coalition with the uh, uh, with the you know liberal conservatives uh, in order to replace uh, the, the Kaczynski party in power, and I think that's the uh, uh, and here if you don't uh, there are many voters in Poland which who would like to probably oppose Kaczynski, but but who believe that voting for the current opposition is not an option. So so the question is. Will something emerge? Will something new emerge? Will the sub political supply, you know, uh, look better? All right, thank you. Uh, the question, judiciary, you dealt with that. Yeah, I, I mean, okay. I, I dealt with that. I hope I answered. Okay, uh, great. Who would like to, to be uh, to somebody over there, please? Hi there. Um, I'm 
Uh, Lex Alexander, and also from the Institute. Um, and I'm not sure that you really answered Rosa's question, because it seems to me that she wasn't only um, asking you about your definition of democracy, she was also questioning your definition of liberalism. Um, and I think this is important because if we're going to understand the, the failure of the centre in Europe, we have to look at their economic policies and the way they failed the majority of people. And if you simply try to defend the, the middle, whether you call it liberal democracy or whether you talk about a left version, one needs to think about their economic policies um, and how the left might be different from the centre. Now, I think there are some alternatives. And I think sometimes the left is attractive to people, whether it's in the form of a kind of left social democracy like Corbyn and in France, or whether it's in the form of a more popular democracy that's arisen out of some of the mass struggles. So I think you have to take these things on board. And I think if you do, you end up with a different picture from the one that you and many other people that I've heard speaking here um, come up with. It's not such a pessimistic picture. There are people who are trying to pose alternatives. So let me ask you about the methodology. Because your methodology, you explained at the end, was looking at opinion polls and looking at election results mainly. I'm sure you've done other things. Um, but what happens if you extend your methodology to look at the actual struggles on the ground that people are fighting, the mobilizations that we see against racism, for instance, in many countries? Would you draw the same conclusions if you broadened your methodology, if you move beyond being a political scientist, perhaps, to becoming more of a, a sociologist, let me put it that way? Does that um, shape the kind of conclusions that you're drawing? Now, I should perhaps say that I have the great privilege of coming from Africa, not from Europe. And so it gives one a different slant on these things, gives one a different perspective. Um, but I think that perspective is a, is a helpful one. Now, you could draw the conclusion that what's happening in Europe is a consequence of the defeat of all of the uprisings that occurred in the wake of Tunisia and Egypt and, and so on. Now, if that is your argument, I'd be very grateful to hear it. Um, or it could be that um, you would say that the kind of mobilizations that I'm talking about are relatively minor. But if they're minor, why do they persist? What are people getting out of them? And are there opportunities to build on them? When you talk about a left in Poland, if it's just a matter of you and you know, friends and so on talking about the need for a left, I'm really very skeptical. I, 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 there is a problem there. I, I, didn't, I didn't understand the last... I'm did. saying that at the end, your conclusion of the last contributions was to say we need a left alternative. Now, that's fine, but I would like to know what that left alternative is based upon, because if it's just um, ideas and academics and so on saying we need it, then I think it's doomed to failure. If it's a left alternative that is based upon mass mobilisation, then it becomes a different question altogether. All right, thank you very much. The, the lady there, thank you, please. Ruja Seleni from Hungary. I'm also a fellow of Piotr and Rosa and Tim. And, well, I actually would like to go on this issue on, on what liberalism and what is not, because I think it's also very interesting. I just uh, want to share with you the, the Hungarian experience. Um, in, in terms of, it's also very much related to what Piotr explained that it's the change actually, the authoritarian change or illiberal change comes from the center. It's so much the case that Viktor Orban n named his regime or the, his strategic aim like 10 years ago, like formulate um, the center force field. And he, when he got to power, he called it a national. Uh, system of cooperation. So there is a national, he opened up a national system of cooperation. He embodies the entire nation, not only th the right, uh, where he is actually uh, in the European field he is placed. He embodies the entire nation. And as you say, he introduced a lot of social policies, which is considered to be leftist. So I actually, I understand very well when Piot says, the liberals, what is the liberal alternative, because actually it's really not the left-right uh, axis any longer, at least in our countries, but an authoritarian versus liberal. Uh, and I, I would like to know a bit more what you think can be, when you say liberal, Piotr, Thank can you. be a kind of rising agenda for the next election? So what can be, which collects all those people who 
want to change the, the current situation. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to finish on, on time. So I'm not going to take any more questions. But we, if you would like to continue the discussion, Piotr will be around. We'll be around a bit. Um, so we've got about two minutes. So like, uh, could you just... Um, Sum yes, I will, I, will, I will do my best. I think, to, you know... To, to, we're just getting going, and then we've got to stop. So, Yeah, please. just, uh, you know, to, 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 the first, to the first question, there was a bunch of uh, extremely interesting remarks, to be honest. And I, I, I certainly would have to answer some of them. I, I would probably think a bit longer than uh, give an immediate, immediate response. But I think the one point is probably um, uh, important i mean this is the, the understanding of liberalism and, and this is i what i what i was saying and i was very much focusing on central eastern europe and on the i'm not i was uh, I'm not. I'm not talking about you know the left uh, um, uh, alternatives in in the UK or um, um, anywhere else. I was I was very much focused on how how we see it from our Central Eastern European perspective and how liberalism is also defined in um, in Central Eastern Europe. And 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 clearly you know the the the, the question of liberal uh, economic reforms and their fallout. Is, is part of the uh, of the problem and and part of the um, uh, our conversation also in Poland and Hungary and and I, I think it's the this is also the, the, the some implications or negative implications are some mistakes which have been made over the time they are also they also can explain you know the course of affairs today i'm i'm i i think i i didn't i didn't say that it it, it was not the case but i think with the liberalism is also one one question very important this is i just wanted to only to to make this point and that a we uh, the question of pluralism and um, and how uh, how encompassing should be the definition of liberal democracy i think this is exactly what the populists attack they have a very you know the question of pluralism or or uh, certain values um, lgbt rights and so on and so forth this is exact in, in our in, in our societies at least but not only here uh, I think this is exactly the point of contention that, and this is uh, where these um, opposition to the idea of liberal democracy comes from, because they claim that it is not just um, a certain model of state or democracy, you know, structures, institutions, which. Uh, which needs uh, to be implemented in order to be a liberal democracy, but also a certain set of very particular values, which are imposed by the West on on Central Eastern uh, European societies. And this is indeed a really a much, I, I think, uh, not less important battle uh, in Poland, in Hungary, than the one, but also in, in whole Europe, than the one about structures, rule of law, independent of judiciary, and so. On. Great. Well, thank you very much. As I said, it's unfortunate. I just feel like the debate is about to get going, but um, we've got to stop. But uh, it's a debate in general, which is uh, obviously going to be dominating uh, Europe and not just Central and Eastern Europe um, for the next uh, few years, if not the next uh, generation. Well, thank you. Thank you very much to the festival for inviting us and for IWM and uh, everybody else who's behind the, the festival and for us being here. Thank you very much and um, have a good rest of the day.